In the 1960s, Ian Brady and his girlfriend, Myra Hindley, sexually abused and murdered young children and teens, then buried their bodies along Saddleworth Moor in what became known as the Moor's Murders. Ian Brady was born on January 2nd, 1938, in Glasgow, Scotland. His mother Peggy Stewart, a 28-year-old single mother who worked as a waitress. His father's identity is unknown, as Peggy was unable to afford proper care for her son. Brady was placed in the care of Mary and John Sloan when he was four months old. Peggy also continued to visit her son until he was 12, although she did not tell him she was his mother. Brady was a troublesome child and prone to throw in angry tantrums. The Sloans had four other children, and despite their efforts to make Brady feel he was a part of their family, he remained distant and was unable to engage with others. Early on, despite his disciplinary problems, Brady demonstrated an above average intelligence. At age 12, he was accepted to Shawlands Academy in Glasgow, which was a secondary school for above average students. The academy offered Brady an environment where despite his background, he could blend in with the multicultural student population. Brady was also smart, although his laziness got the best of him when it came to academic success. He continued to keep distance from his peers and the normal activities of his age group. The only subject that seemed to captivate his interest was World War II. He became fascinated by the human atrocities that took place in Nazi Germany. By age 15, Brady had been to juvenile court twice for burglary. He was also forced to leave Shawlands Academy and began working at a governed shipyard. Within a year, he was arrested again for a series of small crimes, including threatening his girlfriend with a knife. To avoid being sent to a reform school, the court agreed to place Brady on probation, but with the condition that he was to go and live with his birth mother. At the time, Peggy Stewart and her new husband, Patrick Brady, lived in Manchester. Brady moved in with the couple and took his stepfather's name in an effort to solidify the feeling of being part of the family unit. Patrick worked as a fruit merchant and helped Brady find a job at the Smithfield Market. But for Brady, it was his chance to start a new life, but it did not last long. Brady remained a loner. His interest in sadism intensified by reading books on torture and sadomasochism. Within a year, he was arrested again for theft and sentenced to two years in a reformatory. No longer interested in making a legitimate living, he used the time of his incarceration to educate himself about crime. Brady was released from the reformatory in November 1957 and he moved back to his mother's home in Manchester. He had various labour intensive jobs, all which he hated. Deciding he needed a desk job, he taught himself bookkeeping with training manuals he obtained from the public library. At age 20, he got an entry level bookkeeping job at Millwood's Merchandising in Gorton. Brady was a reliable, yet a fairly unremarkable employee. Other than being known to having a bad temper, not much office chatter was spilled in his direction. With one exception, one of the secretaries, 20-year-old Myra Hindley, had a deep crush on him and tried various ways to get his attention. He responded to her much like he did with everyone around him, uninterested, detached and somewhat superior. After a year of being a relentless flirt, Myra finally got Brady to notice her and asked her out on a date. From that point on, the two were inseparable. Myra Hindley was raised in an impoverished home with abusive parents. Her father was ex-military, also an alcoholic and tough when it came to discipline. He believed in an eye for an eye and at an early age taught Hindley how to fight. But to win her father's approval, which she desperately wanted, she would physically confront the male bullies at school, often leaving them bruised and with swollen eyes. But as Hindley got older, she seemed to break the mold and she gained a reputation as being a somewhat shy and reserved young woman. At age 16, she began taking instructions for a formal reception into the Catholic Church and had her first communion in 1958. Friends and neighbours also described Hindley as being reliable, good and trustworthy. It took just one day for Brady and Hindley to realise that they were soulmates. In the relationship, Brady took the role of the teacher and Hindley was a loyal student. Together, they would read Mein Kampf and De Chardé. They spent hours watching X-rated movies and looking at pornographic magazines. Hindley also quit attending church services when Brady told her there was no God. Brady was Hindley's first lover, and she was often left to tend her bruises and bite marks that came during their lovemaking sessions. He would occasionally drug her, then pose her body in various pornographic positions and take pictures that he would then later share with her. Hindley became fixated on being Aryan and dyed her hair blonde. 
She changed her style of clothing based on Brady's desires. She distanced herself from friends and family and often avoided answering questions about her relationship with Brady. As Brady's control over Hinley increased, so did his outrageous demands, which she would make every effort to satisfy without question. For Brady, it meant that he had found a partner who was willing to venture into the gruesome world where rape and murder was the ultimate pleasure. Pauline Reed, age 16, was walking down the street at around 8pm when Hinley pulled over in a van she was driving and asked her to help her find a glove that she had lost. Reed was friends with Hindley's younger sister and agreed to help. According to Hindley, she drove to the Saddleworth Moor and Brady met the two shortly afterwards. He took Reed onto the moor where he beat and raped and murdered her by slashing her throat and then together they buried the body. According to Brady, Hindley participated in this sexual assault. John Kilbride, age 12, was at a market in ashton under Lye, Lancashire, where he accepted a ride home from Brady and Hindley. They took him to the moor where Brady raped, then strangled the boy to death. Keith Bennett, age 12, was walking to his grandmother's house when Hindley approached him and asked him for his help loading boxes into a car and where Brady was also waiting. They offered to drive the boy to his grandmother's house, but instead they took him to Saddleworth Moor where Brady led him into a gully, then raped, beat and strangled him to death, then buried him. Leslie Ann Downey, age 10, was celebrating Boxing Day at the fairgrounds when Hindley and Brady approached her and asked her to help them load packages into their car and put them into the house. Once inside the house, the couple undressed and gagged the child, forced her to pose for pictures, then raped and strangled her to death. The following day, they buried her body on the moors. Edward Evans, age 17, was lured from Manchester Central to Hindley and Brady's home with the promise of relaxation and wine. Brady had seen Evans before in a gay bar where he had chilled looking for victims. Introducing Hindley as his sister, the three drove to Hindley's and Brady's home, which would ultimately become the scene of where Evans would suffer a horrific death. In the early morning hours of October the 7th, 1965, David Smith, armed with a kitchen knife, walked to a public phone and called the police station to report a murder that he'd witnessed earlier in the evening. He told the officer on duty that he was in Hindley and Brady's home when he saw Brady attack a young man with an axe, repeatedly striking him while the man screamed in agony. Shocked and frightened that he would become their next victim, Smith helped the couple clean up the blood, then wrapped the victim in the sheet and placed it upstairs in the bedroom. He then promised to return the next evening to help them dispose of the body. Within hours of the Smith's call, the police searched the Brady's home and found Evans' body. Under interrogation, Brady insisted that he and Evans got into a fight and that he and Smith murdered Evans and that Hindley was not involved. Brady was arrested for the murder and Hindley was arrested four days later as an accessory to murder. Brady was charged with murdering Edward Evans, John Kilbride and Leslie Ann Downey. Hindley was charged with murdering Edward Evans and Leslie Ann Downey and harboring Brady after she knew he had killed John Kilbride. Both Brady and Hindley pleaded not guilty. David Smith was the prosecutor's number one witness until it was discovered that he had entered into an agreement with a newspaper for the exclusive rights to his story if the couple was found guilty. Prior to the trial, the newspaper had paid for the Smiths to go on a trip to France and provided them with a weekly income. They also paid Smith to stay in a five-star hotel during the trial. Smith finally disclosed the news of the world as the newspaper. On the witness stand, Brady admitted to hitting Evans with an axe, but not doing it with the intention of murdering him. After listening to the tape recorded of Leslie Ann Downey and clearly hearing the voices of Brady and Hindley in the background, Hindley admitted that she was brusque and cruel in her treatment of the child because she was afraid that someone might hear her screams. As to the other crimes committed on the child, Hindley claimed to be in the other room or looking out of the window. On May the 6th, 1966, the jury took two hours of deliberation before returning a verdict of guilty of all charges for both Brady and Hindley. Brady was sentenced to three terms of life imprisonment and Hindley received two life sentences and a concurrent seven-year sentence.
After spending almost 20 years in prison, Brady allegedly confessed to the murders of Pauline Reed and Keith Bennett whilst he was being interviewed by a newspaper journalist. Based on that information, the police reopened their investigation, but when they went to the interview, Brady was described as very uncooperative. In November 1986, Hindley received a letter from Winnie Johnson, Keith Bennett's mother, in which she begged Hindley to give her any information about what happened to her son. As a result, Hindley agreed to look at the photos and the maps to identify the places she had been with Brady. Later on, Hindley was taken to Saddleworth Moor, but was unable to identify anything that helped the investigation of the missing children. On February the 10th, 1987, Hindley made a tape confession to her involvement of the murders of Pauline Reed, John Kilbride, Keith Bennett and Leslie Ann Downey, and Edward Evans. She did not confess to being present during the actual murders of any of the victims. When Brady was told of Hindley's confession, he did not believe it, but once he was given the details that only he and Hindley knew, he knew that she had confessed. He also agreed to confess, but with a condition that could not be met, which was a way to kill himself after confessing. Hindley again visited the moor in March 1987, and although she was able to confirm the area that was being searched was on target, she could not identify the exact location of where the children were buried. On July the 1st, 1987, Pauline Reed's body was found and buried in a shallow grave, close to where Brady had buried Leslie and Downey. Two days later, Brady was taken to the moor, but claimed that the landscape had changed too much and he was unable to help in the search of Keith Bennett's body. The following month, the search was called off. Ian Brady spent the first 19 years of his incarceration at Durham Prison. In November 1985, he moved to Ashworth Psychiatric Hospital after being diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. Myra Hindley suffered a brain aneurysm in 1999 and died in prison on November the 15th, 2002 from complications brought on by heart disease. Reportedly, over 20 undertakers refused to cremate her remains. The case of Brady and Hindley is considered one of the most spine-chilling serial crimes in Great British history.